notes, lessons from Pergamum and uh, Thyatira. So in light of the various aspects of the trials and testing and fire that we talked about yesterday, we're looking at these seven churches uh, as an example to us about what Jesus is looking for from us in the last days. What is it? What's the quality of life he's looking for in his people as we go into this time of testing? What is the the fruit he's looking for when he brings the fire. You know, he's not just bringing it randomly. He's bringing it because he loves us. He cares about us. And he's zealous to purge from us the things that he won't allow into his kingdom before that kingdom comes. So ultimately, the fire, as painful as it may be sometimes, it's always motivated by his goodness. And it's always defined in terms of the big picture, ultimately. So we're not going to spend a ton of time on the background, but I do want to uh, I want to give a few little pieces of information to provide some context for some of the, the very intense statements that Jesus makes in the letters to Pergamum and Thyatira. Pergamum, the background, uh, Roman numeral one, letter A, uh, point one here. It became a Roman province in 130 BC, and it was briefly the capital of the Roman province of Asia before it was moved to Ephesus. And all the main roads of Western Asia converged in Pergamum, there's three rivers in the area, one of which went to the sea, so it was a fertile area. The city was dominated by a huge hill, about 1,000 feet above sea level. It had an acropolis, an acropolis is just a city on a hill, basically, where uh, up on the hill there were some of the main buildings of the city. It had a stadium, a theater, an amphitheater, gymnasiums, many temples, a university, a large library, how many of you have heard of the, the Library of Alexandria? It was the, by far the most uh, important library in the ancient world. Uh, but number two was here in Pergamum. It had about 200,000 volumes, which was a pretty substantial library in those days. Uh, uh, it also had about 200,000 residents. It was an illustrious and wealthy city, and it was particularly famous for the production of parchment, which uh, Pergamena. You can see the influence there, even in the name of it. Number four, it had many temples and was the religious center of Asia. You know, uh, Ephesus was prom more prominent in, in other ways, but in terms of religion and in terms of the, the, uh, the spiritual significance, the number of temples, the, the willingness to incorporate all, just any, any new god, any any new spiritual influence and bring it into the mix, it seems that, that Pergamum was leading the charge in that area. There was, an, there was a temple to the Egyptian gods Isis and Seraphis in a grove called Nisiphorium were temples to Zeus, Athena, and Dionysus. And in, you know, in the ancient world, pagan worship temple, in these temples, I mean, idolatry and immorality went hand in hand. And those groves were, uh, were really full of filthy acts in the context to worshiping false idols. And I'll just leave it at that. South of the Acropolis was a temple to Asclepios, the god of healing, which he was worshipped in the form of a living serpent fed in the temple. That's kind of freaky. But um, on the upper part of the Acropolis was the great altar of Pergamum dedicated to Zeus, which is now in Berlin, from what I understand. They, uh, when they, they dug it up, they, they took it to Germany. Number five, um, you know, I, I'm kind of going into a little more detail on the, on the temple and the religious aspect here. Number one, because they were famous for it. But because when we get to the letter, we're going we're gonna to read a reference about the throne of Satan, where th Satan has his throne. And these are all good candidates <laughs> for contributing to the understanding of what that means, right? So, um, you know, to have the great altar of Pergamum dedicated to Zeus on the upper part of the Acropolis, um, some scholars think that that's what the Apostle John is referring to. Um, but there, are, as we'll see here, number five, there are some other good candidates. Who knows? It could be Jesus probably, I'm, he, I'm sure he had all three of them in mind, really, but... Um, Asclepios was known as the god of Pergamum and on coins was represented by a rod encircled by a serpent. And it's still a medical symbol today. 
So that's the origins of that symbol um, in medicine. You know, they're worshiping the, the serpent in the temple. So near the temple of Asclepios was a university for the study of medicine. And Pergamum was one of the most famous therapeutic healing, or healing centers in the Roman world. Number six, you know, a lot of times when we're sick and we're, we need healing, you know, that's when we're in that place of vulnerability, that's where our, we get in that, desper, that place of desperation. We look for help, right? And, and you either look to the one true God for healing or you look to, to the false gods. And so, you know, Pergamum gets a reputation for healing and a lot of people flocking there to study. Number six, Pergamon was the first city in Asia with a temple dedicated to Augustus and Rome. It became the center in the province for worship of the emperor. And the terms Lord, Savior, and God, they were regularly used in reference to the emperor. And of course, if you're a believer, that puts you in a tight spot. Because, you know, the believers in, in, in the Roman Empire, those words were reserved for only one. Right? Jesus, Lord, Savior, and God. And to apply those to Augustus and Rome would be idolatry and unfaithfulness to the Lord. So we've got, we've got Asclepios and the, this entire cult built around healing and medicine. We've got the great altar dedicated to Zeus at the top of the Acropolis. And you also got Pergamum as the center of Roman emperor worship. This is a pretty intense place. There's a few demons running around this city. Thyatira, let's go to the next page, letter B. 40 miles southeast of Pergamum. It's a trading center. Um, this is kind of more, if, if you think of, of Pergamum as the white collar town and more of the, you know, the academic types, if you will, Pergamum is the blue collar city. It's a trading center. It's home to many guilds. It's, it's full of dyers and potters, tanners, weavers, bakers, robe makers, and unfortunately, slave traders. It was a supplier for the Roman garrison in Pergamum. Uh, it was also famous for an abundance of crops and purple dye. Remember Lydia from Acts 16? She was originally from here. She was a, she, uh, it actually mentions, mentions her, her uh, uh uh, that she was from, from here and that her occupation uh, totally, it fil fits with the description of, of Thyatira as a, a city of guilds. Number three, pa Apollo the sun god was the main deity worshipped in Thyatira. And number four, each guild was dedicated to a patron god. The guilds had feasts in the temples with meat offered to the various gods and they, the guild was dedicated to that patron god presumably because they thought that that patron God would help them out with their business, right? So it's always interesting. Money, immorality, idolatry. It's just kind of this web that seems to always go together wherever you go. And it's an interesting question to speculate. What is the devil after when he's always bringing these three realities together? And what is he, what is he trying to distort? What is he trying to pervert? What is he trying to you know, when he's trying to rob God of worship, you know, what, what is he going for? And what are these realities? How, does he, how, do they, how do they do that? Well, we're going to see some of that here in, the, in these letters. Now, as, as you're going to see with all the letters, Jesus starts off with affirmations. And there are a couple of churches that get only affirmations. And then most of them, they, they receive some affirmations, some good job guys keep going for it from Jesus, and then he moves on to some rebukes and some things that really need to be corrected in their midst. So we're going to start off with the attributes of Jesus highlighted, and then we're going to move into, just follow the outline there, of the affirmations and the rebukes. The attributes of Jesus that are highlighted to the church in Pergamum, Revelation 2.12, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. Now, when we think of a sharp double-edged sword, we need to realize that these are pictures that communicate who Jesus is as a judge, as a ruler, right? As one with authority. He has authority to wield a sword, and he has authority to judge. We also need to realize that 
the king exercises that authority by means of his words. Solomon, right, he says something, and the people do it, right? There's authority in his word. But with Jesus, it's not just that he, people do what he says. Angels do what he says. People do what he says. But Jesus has the power to actually speak a word, and as the, the word of God, the eternal logos, by, through whom the, word, the, the universe was created, if he says, you're done, you're done. <laughs> it's over for you. And this is really interesting to think about as we get into talking about Jesus highlighting this attribute, um, to think of it in contrast to Satan's throne, right? The imposter. And, you know, just, you know, thinking through that. But let's read this here. Uh, Revelation 1.16, it, it uses the same language. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The sword is sharp and it cuts deep. Nothing is hidden. Every thought, every motive, every, every inclination of our heart, it's seen. And if the judge of the earth knows that when he comes in power and glory, that that thought or motive or inclination will not stand in his presence. He speaks a word, the spirit groans, and he cuts at it. <laughs> and it's purifying, but it's painful, right? It's purifying, but it's good. It's clean in the end. You know, when the Lord rebukes us for our sin, we repent in his presence, and then we stand up and, like, you feel clean. Man, you just wish it wouldn't have been there to begin with, but when he re rebukes it and burns it away, it feels clean. Isaiah 11, I love the power, I love the, the picture here of, you know, this is talking, we're still here talking about the judge on his throne, sitting on David's throne in his coming kingdom. The spirit of the Lord will rest on this root, this shoot that will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And then the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, fear of the Lord. He'll delight in the fear of the Lord. And then he will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. The Messiah is going to judge and make judgments and decisions and render, uh, render decisions between the nations of the earth, individuals, by means of the Spirit and an accurate understanding and a not, no distortion in his judgments. It will be perfectly in accordance with the truth. He's not just going to look at outward appearances. He'll know the actual situation. He'll decide not by what he hears with his ears, not by what this person says or this person says or this person says. Somebody may try to distort, uh, distort their presentation of the situation. He's like, I know the reality of the situation. He judges according to perfect justice for the poor of the earth. And he'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. A good example of that is Zechariah 14 where the Egyptians refused to come up and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and he strikes the earth with the rod of his mouth. He gives a decree, and no rain happens. That's a good example there of, of what that means. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Zechariah 14, there's another good example of that, where the, the Antichrist armies, the Messiah returns, and he speaks, and their, how does it say, their flesh rots off of their faces and their eyes. Their eyes go back in their heads. All kinds of crazy stuff's happening. Don't want to be on the side of the Antichrist armies when Jesus comes back. Okay? He's not just, you know, people get into these, it's not nuclear this or nuclear that, you know. No, Jesus speaks and you die if he wants you to die. If, if, he, if, if the just judge sees that that is the, the worthy punishment that needs to be administered, then he speaks the word and it happens. He is Yahweh incarnate. Romans 2.16, this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. The gospel isn't just warm fuzzies, <laughs> okay? The Messiah is God's ordained instrument for examining the thoughts and motives of our hearts, and this was central to Paul's gospel. And if we don't keep that in mind, then we're going to have a disordered understanding of the gospel ourselves. Number two, Thyatira. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. You've all seen pictures of glowing metal, right? That's the picture here. It's that hot, fiery, glowing metal that's pure through and through, and his eyes are burning like fire. And you see 
What does it look like to look at Jesus and his hands and his feet and his body is like glowing metal. And if you touch him in a, you know, pre-resurrection, I, mean, I, I, don't, you know, I don't know how that works. But, I mean, he, he's full of fire. And I think it's so interesting that the main deity worshipped in Thyatira was Apollo the sun god. And here's Jesus saying, no, 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 no. You want to know who's really full of fire? You want to know who's really brighter than the sun? It's me. It's me. I think that's really interesting there that he highlights this one. Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from him. All things are naked, exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. His eyes are full of fire. And again, he looks at the depths of our hearts with perfect zeal, perfect love, but when he sees something that needs to be removed and purged, he's zealous about getting it out of us. Isaiah 33, from the heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind from his dwelling place. He watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. He considers our actions and our attitudes in the kitchen. He considers our attitudes and our actions when we're driving, with our kids, with our families. He's taking it all into consideration. And the knowledge of that is designed to produce the fear of the Lord in us and to just have this kind of background awareness at all times. My master's watching me. He's watching me. He's watching when you give in secret. He's watching when you... Uh, lay down your life, when you give something up, when, when you restrain from speaking in a certain way, when you wanted to speak in a way that, that wouldn't be edifying or that, that wouldn't be full of truth or that my, an innuendo. He's watching. He's, and you restrain from speaking in a way that defiles somebody's conscience. He's watching and he notices that and he'll reward that in his coming kingdom. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12. Who among us can dwell with consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Well, the rhetor it's a rhetorical question, but the answer is those who themselves have been purged and cleansed by the very fire with whom they're destined to dwell. Right? Right? Jesus is applying enough fire to get us clean but not destroy us. And then by the time he comes back, he's going to fill us with the same fire that fills him. It's awesome. That's who can dwell with, with the consuming fires, those who have been, have their dross consumed now. And obviously we can't do that ourselves. We have to boast in him for sanctification just as much as we do for justification and boast in him for, glor for glorification. It's by faith from first to last. Affirmations uh, to the church in Pergamum. Clinging to Jesus' name, a faithful witness. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. I think this is just an interesting verse. I mean, you've got the historical context we talked about with the idolatry in Pergamum. But, you know, in light of some of the stuff Joel teaches related to uh, the Antichrist being a, an Islamic-based uh, reality, the Antichrist empire, and specifically, if you guys read through some of his books, uh, Turkey, Turkey is kind of at the focus of, of that. It's just interesting to think about that all seven of these letters are based in the place where it, there's lots of biblical indication that this will be the head of the Antichrist empire in the last days. I, you know, Jesus, I don't think this is coincidence. Anyway, it's just, I'll chew on that. We'll see. Um, but interesting, where Satan has his throne. So, there, you know, the Lord obviously probably is thinking on several different levels at the same time with this. Yet you remain true to my name. So the implication here is that Satan is exercising his authority on this throne through the idolatry in this area to try them to become untrue to Jesus' name. Okay? To try them to get them to deny their allegiance to him. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. And what's interesting here 
is that Antipas, he's called, he, 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 the definition of a faithful witness is here one who remained loyal to Jesus and faithful to Jesus, even unto death, and in so doing, showing that Jesus is more worthy than Satan of his allegiance. And Satan's throne is right there. Luke 9. And so he, he, he encourages them for, the, for his faithfulness here. He was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. But the seed and the so good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast or bear fruit with or, th or through perseverance. Romans 5, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character produces hope. The fire and the testing comes. You hold tight to Jesus through it. The, the dross gets removed, and it produces hope that in the same way that he sustained you and was faithful to you through the fire by means of, by means of which our deception is removed, by that same faithfulness, he will raise us from the dead. He will see it through to the end. We have hope that by his work, not our own, but by his work, he will make us into vessels that he considers worthy of being with forever in his kingdom. But perseverance presupposes something to be persevered through, <laughs> right? You don't, you don't get character by a carefree existence. You know, if you talk to anybody, really, they'll say that the most significant lessons they learn in this age are through hardships. They don't say like, yeah, I, I learned these profound things of this season where I had no problems and I had great, nice new cars and, and nothing was ever going wrong. I just really touched the Lord's heart in that season. <laughs> like nobody, like, right? No, that, nobody talks like that. It's always through the most, the, the way God sustained us through the difficult times where the deepest lessons were learned. All right. So I'll uh, you read these, uh, those, those other verses there uh, on your own. Let's go to letter C. Affirmations to the church in Thyatira. Deeds, love, faith, service, perseverance, growth. I know your deeds, your love, and your faith, your service, and perseverance. And that you are now doing more than you did at first. The ESV says that your latter works exceed the first works, the initial works, the earlier works. And the same idea Paul is... Um, is encouraging the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, how you ought to have good deeds, how you ought to have love and faith, how you ought to have service, how you ought to have perseverance, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more, that the fruit increases and keeps on growing, that you don't See yourself as having arrived until the day you're actually up from the dirt and resurrected glory. You know, Paul in Philippians, I don't even consider myself to have yet obtained it. But he's trusting the Lord to see him through, to the, the, through the entire race until the day of Christ Jesus. So the point here is that in the last days, these are things that we want to see in our churches we want these things to burn brightly in our midst. We want faithful deeds. We want good fruit. We want a faithful witness. We want to give our lives even unto death, even if we're before the very throne of Satan himself. And he's going to have lots of centers of power in these days. We want to be a faithful witness, a true witness. We want our deeds to be full of self-sacrifice and love and humility. We want to do more than we did at first. We want people to see, wow, I see that fruit in your life. You know, I, there, when I first got married, I didn't even, th I look back and I think, I, surely I wasn't even saved. Surely I wasn't saved. I mean, the level of arrogance and self-righteousness constantly, my wife, I'm like, how in the world did she endure it? But, but and you get discouraged, I mean, there have been times where you're like, God, I just want to see a breakthrough in character. I want to see a breakthrough in this area. And it's, it's hard when you're in the day-to-day, -day, but when you look back over years and you're like, wait a minute, 
You know, obviously, I can't produce that, but man, the Lord has produced some fruit. And it's, so I just, just, that's just a little side thing to encourage you in the midst of like you're feeling the discouragement of the day to day kind of stumbling. Balance that with the year to year and kind of, and bring it in perspective. So that, that helps me. Now, the correction, the rebuke side. Okay, this is where we got to buckle up. <laughs> Jesus, help us. We all like the affirmations, right? And then Jesus starts saying, I got to get in your face a little bit, guys. We got some issues to deal with. And I got 20 minutes to deal with them here. So let's rock and roll. All right, Pergamum. They had a problem called fellowship with idols or demons and sexual immorality. And as we talked about earlier, these things, together with greed, always seem to go together. Money, immorality, idol worship. Seems like demons really like those things, and there's something about them that they really seem to, to be pretty aggressive about. Let's read Revelation 2.17. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. And so, you know, we read here, we, this, it's really important to know, well, okay, the teaching of Balaam or Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. So we need to know what, what actually happened there because there are some inferences that are made in the book of Numbers that apparent Jesus is making explicit here in Revelation. So we know the story. I'm not going to go into the whole story, but we know the story of how Balak is scared of the Israelites. He, doesn't, he, he knows what happened to Egypt, and he's afraid we're about to get our tails kicked in battle here. We're about to be overtaken by this group that has come out of, his, uh, come out of Egypt. So he, he, he says, we've got to deal with this. And his way of dealing with it is to try to find somebody that has a reputation for some spiritual power. Right? And so he knows, oh, I, here's, there's this guy, Balaam. And we're going to send for him. And we're going to ask him to come and put curses on this people so that bad things will happen to them. Okay? That happens all the time it's happened i mean it, you know I, I've, I've heard stories of people trying to put curses on sports games and things like that you know just it's crazy but the i you know trying to manipulate situations by means of spiritual power in the form of a curse right that's what's happening here but balaam god intervenes he says uh uh let's and, and numbers 24 balak's anger burned against balaam he struck his hands together and said to him, I, I brought you here, I summoned you here to curse my enemies, but you have blessed, these, blessed them these three times. Now leave it once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely. What's that? That's called money, right? I was going to give you some money, man. I was going to pay you off. All you had to do was come and curse them, but the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. <laughs> right? The Lord's kept your money from you, man. Balaam answered Balak, did I not tell the messengers you sent me? Even if Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything of my own accord, good or bad, to go beyond the command of the Lord. I must say only what the Lord says. He couldn't get a curse through, right? How, how can your little curse overcome Yahweh when Yahweh himself is protecting and sustaining, right? It's not going to happen. So, and just to say it, like, if you're going to use the language of John 10, uh, Balaam couldn't snatch the Israelites out of Yahweh's hand, right? He couldn't. He couldn't snatch them out of his hand. But the Israelites themselves could put themselves in an adversarial relationship with Yahweh, and that's what happened. So it's what the... The inference from what Jesus says in Revelation 2 is basically that Balaam couldn't get them directly. So he came in the back door. He had a strategy. And the strategy was, Balak, if you can get them to, in, to give in to the lust of their flesh, basically, in New Testament language, to give in 
to their flesh and indulge in immorality and give themselves to idols, then you won't have to curse them because God himself, by virtue of his character, will have to discipline them. See it? And so that's what he does. And it says, uh, Numbers 25, uh, Israel was staying in Shittim. The men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices of their gods. They've been seduced. They've, they've defiled their bodies and now it's the next step. Oh, let's go, let's go worship some idols. The people ate and bowed down before these gods. This was after the covenant at Sinai, right? They're married to Yahweh at this point. See what I'm saying? They're married. They're married to Yahweh. They've signed the marriage deal. The blood has been sprinkled on them. And so for them to do this, they're going into an adulterous relationship with these false gods. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of these people, kill them. And expose them in broad daylight before the Lord so that the Lord's fierce anger may turn away from Israel. Got to deal with this problem now. We're going to purge the leaven from the lump, if you will. This is intense, right? Now, Jesus is the word of God. This is before he's made flesh. But this word is coming through Jesus pre-incarnate. This is the same guy, right? So the intensity does, you know, it's not... Big, bad, Old Testament, Jehovah God, New Testament, Barney, Jesus. I mean, just the crazy things that are out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know what I'm saying? I love you, you love me, we're a happy. Yeah, it's just like the God of glory. Anyway, so now they're sinning. The immorality is, is they're bringing an adversarial relationship against the, uh, from God against themselves. God responds by cutting off those who do it. And Balaam knows that God will cut them off. I mean, isn't the deceit? There? I'm just like, bro, Balaam, it's not going to turn out for you good in the days to come, man. But, but God protect us because we all kind of have that manipulative kind of thing, right, going on in us. But anyway... Um, so the sacrifice, eating food sacrificed to idols. When you sacrifice to idols, it's, food always seems to be an integral part of worship. Even true worship, right? They would go and they'd offer the sacrifice. They'd, they'd offer the sin offering. And, and then part of it would go to the priest, part of it on the altar. And then they'd get to eat some of it. Eating, it's like I just, I, I sinned against Yahweh. I come, I've got to atone for my sin. The, 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 the sacrifice is accepted, and now I eat with him. What is that going to do to your conscience? I was in an, I was, it, was, it was a hostile situation, but now he's eating with me, right? There's fellowship. There's communion. It, it speaks to your heart like, okay, okay, I'm, I'm on good terms now because of the atonement with the God of Israel, the one true God who's the judge of the living and the dead. The same, the same here um, goes in the opposite direction. To offer food sacrificed to idols in that situation, knowing, in, you know, you still have to, you have to work through, you know, the passage Romans 14 and others, but it's a different situation here where there's something about this situation where everybody involved knows that idols are involved and demons are involved in the situation, okay? We're not just talking here about loving our brother by not eating. There's a different dynamic in that situation. Here, the dynamics involved, there's clearly, there's idolatry happening, okay? Now here, Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, let's read it, what he says here. We know the word koinonia, right? I mean, most Christians know it means fellowship, communion. It can mean partnership in a business context. But here, um, Paul is telling them, I don't want you to have fellowship, koinonia, communion, partnership with demons. That's what's happening when they offer food sacrificed to idols, when they eat it. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices, partakers, fellowshippers, participants of the altar? What I am saying, what am I saying then? That an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything? 
Now, the point isn't how awesome a piece of stone or wood is. The point is that the things which, are gen which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. There's the problem. The idol, the actual image, is just a means to somehow connecting with a demon. Okay? I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. I don't want you becoming friends with demons. I don't want you learning the ways of demons and connecting with demons and having communion with demons. Because demons do immoral things. Demons do things that bring punishment and judgment on you. That Things that God is going to judge severely don't have fellowship with those that are already destined to be cut off in the day, in the day of the Lord. Okay? Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? If we're in covenant with Him and then we start fellowshipping with demons, we're committing adultery, spiritual adultery. Ephesians 5, 5 through 7. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes or it can be translated, will certainly come on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Let no one deceive you with empty words, with words that are going to create a distorted perception of reality, the reality of the situation. In the academic world, in seminaries, it's not uncommon to, common to find people dismissing immorality uh, as a cultural type of thing. Well, you know, that was Paul's Jewish conservative Hebrew culture finding expression. Da, 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 da. No, that is deception. Let no one deceive you with empty words, whether they have a thousand footnotes backing it up. Or whether there's some guy in the factory who just wants you to get you to look at that Playboy magazine. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Now, you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, 1 Thessalonians 4. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. It is His will, it is His desire that you should avoid sexual immorality. The Lord will punish men for all such sins. As we have already told you and warned you, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject men, man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. His Spirit is sufficient to cleanse us. He does, Jesus doesn't say, if you look at a woman to lust for her, you're committing adultery with her, and then give you no provision for actually walking it out because he knows you can't do that on your own. He gives you the Holy Spirit, those groans. I mean, I can't. I'll tell. I just. I'm, I'm just going to say it. You know, there there have been times. I can remember a couple times specifically, where I'd be just going about my business, and suddenly. You're, you're you come across a beautiful woman. And I, I remember a couple, one time, a couple times, several, many times, whatever, but like it's whatever. I don't know what demon hit me and jumped on my back, but he wanted fellowship with me. And some, between the lust of the flesh and the demons, and, and I just immediately felt like something on me, and that woman's everything in me. It was like, at that moment, it's like, I want to kill Uriah the Hittite and take Bathsheba for myself. And in that moment, the cravings are just journey. You're like, God, what do I do? And he says, cry out in your moment of temptation. And I remember, I'd go to the bathroom. It's the only private place I could find because it's somebody else's house or whatever. And I'd go into the toilet and close the door and I'd hit my face and begin to weep. God, come to my aid. Holy Spirit, come to my aid right now. You know what? I hope nobody was in the other stalls. <laughs> but you're crying out in your head. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've been in that situation. And I feel this groan come into me. And just the t in the midst of the tears and the cry. <sighs> And I feel strength come into me. That, that Too deep for words even. Too deep for words. 
And I get up and I'm like, okay, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. And the strength that comes in that place, just the mercy of God. But he's serious about it. He's serious about it. And the provisions are there. It doesn't mean it's easy, but we got to hit our faces and call on his name. And he will do what he said. I've got five minutes. So I'm just going to do uh, the main, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the next section here, the Nicolaitans. Um, I'll let you read a little bit about them. Their traditions. Some people believe that it was Nicholas in the book of Acts who apostatized. Was the, some people, Irenaeus says that he was the founder of the sect. There's debate. Other church fathers say no. Uh, other writer, ancient writers say no. It was somebody who took a saying of Nicholas out of context and formed a sect around it. And basically, to give themselves over to indulgence and immorality, it was a Gnostic sect that manifested itself in immorality. Not good in light of the, the context of what we just read. So I'll let you read a little bit more about the Nicolaitans. Thyatira, God's, we, this is where we have Jezebel. Jezebel, nevertheless, I have this against you. Tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess by her teaching. She misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. And I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering or a bed of sickness or a sick bed, a bed of violent illness. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. This is not the devil doing this, people. I will do it unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Jesus, don't you have a religious spirit? I mean, all the things that... The little catchphrases we use to kind of just get out of the fact that Jesus loves certain things and he hates other things. And the things that he hates, in his mercy and love, he wants to get rid of them. They're destroying us anyway. They're destroying us anyway. As painful as it may be, let's let him get that stuff out of us to prepare us for the age to come, people. Otherwise, he'll strike her children dead. He's serious. About, he gave them time to repent. There was mercy there. There was an extension of mercy. He didn't want to strike her children dead. He gave them time. But he knows that if I, I'll give her as much time as I can. But if I don't deal with the situation soon enough, the yeast is going to spread through the whole lump in the church. People are going to think, I don't care about this. I've got to deal with it. And for the sake of the good of the church as a whole, I'm going to deal with this. Same with Ananias and Sapphira, right? He struck them dead. And it became an example to the church. And not only that, but in 1 Corinthians 11, you can read it for yourself. He talks about the discipline of the Lord. He's disciplining us so that we will not share in condemnation in the, in, in the day of the Lord. He says, some of you are taking the communion in an unworthy manner. And this is why some of you are dead. <laughs> How many of you, when you take that little cup and that cracker, you're thinking, God, the cross is my only means of forgiveness, and it's my only means of cleansing. I boast in you to do the work. I boast in you, to, you, you, you who began it in me to bring it to completion. I boast in you. Oh, God, let me take this in a worthy manner. Let me proclaim your death until you come. Sobriety. Endure hardship as discipline. Exhortations. Just read the, the first verses here. Repent, other, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is to Pergamum. I will meet them in battle with the sword of my mouth if they don't repent. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. True manna, or the hidden manna, it, you know, some think that it's a reference to the, the manna that was tucked away in the ark. Well, in, 
um, you know, Aaron's, or the man that the, the Israelites gathered, they, they, they put it back there. Um, and, you know, Jeremiah 3 says that the ark, you know, it, sa- it sounds like Jesus himself is going to take the place of the ark in the age to come. Jesus calls himself the, the, the manna that came down from heaven. So I don't know what it means to exactly... For him to give me some of the hidden manna, but if it involves Jesus and it involves the Holy of Holies somehow, I want it. All right? The old word, and then the, the white stone, this is just a little cultural fact that is um, uh, interesting. This old word for pebble, pasau, to rub, was used in courts of justice. This is at the bottom of the page. Black pebbles for condemning, white pebbles for acquitting. The only other use of the word in the New Testament is in Acts 26.10, where Paul speaks of depositing his pebble or casting his vote. So the white pebble is a judicial context. The white pebble means not guilty. The black pebble means guilty. Jesus is saying, I've cast my vote in your favor. If you overcome, I'm saying, come and dine on the hidden manna because you have received my vote. <laughs> you're acquitted into the, you're, you, you're, you know, the acquittal you received at your repentance has been demonstrated in your faithfulness expressed to me now and for all the world to see you're vindicated you're not condemned Thyatira hold fast and overcome now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so called deep secrets Satan's so called deep secrets yeah that doesn't ever lead to a good place I will not impose any other burden on you Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches in the first century. No. These are messages for all of us. The morning star is a, it's a, it's a picture of authority. It's a symbol of governmental authority, power, authority, governance, the rod, the scepter, the morning star, you know, and there's a, throughout, there's a history in the scriptures actually of, of governance related to these things. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule, to govern the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. It's a governmental idea. It's um, shining, indicating the times and the seasons. You know, not literally controlling, but governing and indicating and communicating. I am the, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things. I am the root, the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. I am the descendant of David, governmental, right? David's throne, the bright and morning star who rules over the creation. Now, the bright and morning star, I like, you know, for Second Peter 1 we have the prophetic message confirmed even more. The word in regard to what you do well, if you keep paying attention, careful attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. And I, in, my, in the tra- way I'm going to translate it here, um, I'm putting the comma there. In your hearts, knowing this first of all. And the point here is that the morning star most likely refers to the planet Venus. In Revelation and in, in Second Peter, there are different words here, but it seems that they're talking about the same idea. That the morning star refer, likely refers to the planet Venus, though some po- think it possibly refers to the sun. Besides the sun, Venus is the brightest star in the sky, reaching its maximum brightness just before sunrise or just after sunset, depending on where it is in its, uh, its orbit of the sun. Just as the morning star heralds the end of the night and the beginning of the new day, so the second coming will mark the end of this age of darkness and the beginning of his day, his rule, his governance, and he's going to share that with those that he deems worthy who receive the white pebble. If there's any time in history where we need to take Jesus' message to the church in Pergamum and Thyatira seriously, what he's looking for, what he's serious about, what he warns about, it is this hour. A climax of wickedness at the end of the age requires a climax of attentiveness on the part of the church, okay? Uh, And... It's the same is true for all the other letters. Let's pray, and we'll get ready for a break. Father, I ask in Jesus' name for you to take the lessons to these churches and imprint them on our hearts, Master. And I pray that we would take them seriously, that we would fear your name, 
that we would not take your warnings trivially and dismiss them, God, but we would tremble before them, Jesus, that we would tremble before the sword of your mouth and that even before we stand before you face to face, that, Jesus, you would come with your word, which is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, which penetrates to the very core of our DNA, our soul and our spirit, our joint and our marrow, that judges and divides the thoughts and intentions and motives of our hearts, the secret things. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to prepare us and sanctify us. We make our boast in you from beginning to end, from first to last, in Jesus' name. Amen.